This is the Forge Audio Network, your official source for all things Forge FC. Here's your host, Anthony Urgioli. And we check in again with our Forge fan in Qatar, James Hutton. James, uh, last time we spoke, we were we were hoping Canada would score a goal uh, against Belgium. And then a few minutes into that opening match, it was like, okay, I they can actually win this match. It's kind of funny how our expectations have changed as this tournament's gone on. Yeah, very much so. I think, uh, I mean, even through qualifying, it was very much, all right, well, hopefully we can snag fourth and be in a playoff spot. And the expectations just continue to soar, I think, for this team. And by all accounts, even though we didn't have to get the result yesterday, I think we're very much exceeding or meeting those expectations that the players are setting for themselves. Yeah, take us into that atmosphere. Um, you know, you and I spoke before about just the 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 level of Canadian support in Qatar, and some of that has to do with Canada being an underdog, especially against Belgium. I saw a lot of red in those stands. Am I are my eyes deceiving me, or is there plenty of Canadian support over there in Qatar? No, very much so. I think there's even a history of it. I think you know, in the World Cup in Brazil, Canada was the best represented team that didn't actually have a team in the tournament. And that seems to be coming true right now. Uh, there were, I think, 24,000 people at a Canadian address who bought a ticket for this tournament. So uh, we were, I think, all surprised to see what the stadium was going to look like when we approached it yesterday. Um, and you didn't get a true taste until you had actually made it to the stadium. It wasn't like you were hanging out at bars beforehand or anything along those lines. So when we got in, there was actually flags being handed out for free for both Belgium and for uh, Canada fans, and no one was taking a Belgian flag. Wow. And suddenly when you're in, in and around the concourse, you're like, oh, there's, there's a lot of us. I think, I think this is going to be all right. And sure enough, uh, I think between you know, a, a positive international reputation and uh, being the underdogs, I think the neutrals took to us as well. So we were thrilled with the atmosphere and the environment uh, as fans yesterday. And by all accounts, it's one of the best games I've been at at the World Cup this year. Wow. And I mean, that's in stadium. What about before, after the entire game day experience when your club is in action? Yeah, it's something kind of bizarre because that was the fourth game to take place that day. So by all accounts, you almost don't want to burn out your energy on the other three that are happening. Um, There's obviously the central locations you can watch from, but I think most Canadian fans were taking it easy. Maybe a few had a ticket to another game. Uh, And then it was a matter of, you know, getting to the stadium. The stadium happened to be beside the largest uh, Qatari mall. So everyone got food in there, but, uh, you know, of course, no drinks. So moving from there into the stadium, that was brilliant. And then by the time you leave, obviously a level of disappointment, but uh, in a way, enthusiastic disappointment. Uh, And it was probably about. 12 30 before we got out of there and uh, you know i didn't get to bed till three so a different type of post-game situation but i suspect all the canadian fans would would have been singing back to their hotels uh, should we have gotten a a stronger result you know i I think it's fitting that there's a bit of a light shining above your head right now and a little bit on your face because i i dubbed you the the forge prophet the the messenger in qatar that is spreading the word of Forge, I know you've been handing out swag and you've been talking to a lot of fans from outside of Canada that are genuinely curious. What is Forge FC? How is that mission of yours gone? Have have you converted any fans yet? Yeah, well, it's been fun. Uh, I've been meeting a few Mexican supporters who will recognize us from the Champions League game against Cruz Azul. So that's been uh, brilliant. But I think just the level of excitement from the Canada game people are starting to ask, well, where are these players playing? Why haven't I seen them or heard of them? And the rest of it, and that sparks that conversation about development and the Canadian Premier League. But since that result, I've had conversations from Uruguayans and Belgians and Scottish and Welsh and, you know, all all sorts saying, you guys played brilliantly. Um, and by all accounts, that's the first thing that follows after they say, oh, where are you from? Oh, wow, that was an amazing game. How could you not win that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's incredible how quickly thing the perception even has changed. Not just for you know neutral supporters or supporters of other nations watching Canada, but Canadians themselves. I think, I mean, we we've talked about this, but the brand of football Canada's playing and the way they played against Belgium, it, it, if for a lot of people in Canada who 
obviously they're aware of soccer and they've seen soccer, but they've, you know, maybe they haven't been that interested, but now they're kind of all in because Canada's in, they're getting to watch a very exciting brand of soccer. And, you know, as Forge fans, we've seen that style played under Bobby Smirniotis for a while, but it really is a great way to introduce people to the national team with this very exciting brand of football. Yeah. And I think that's also one of the similarities uh, that seems to be shaping up between Canada and Forge is when we have these international games and we're playing against, you know, the unknown, so to speak, you know, Bobby just goes for the juggler. Let's go get a goal in the first five minutes in Honduras. And that seemed to be the case last night was, well, there's no better time to score than right away and let shell shock them and win the first balls and the second balls and the third balls to ensure we have uh, as much possession and as many opportunities as we can. So this high energy, but extremely organized Canadian side, I think has been really impressive. And I think that's a bit of a theme of the tournament. Uh, it seems to be perhaps not the players that are getting the job done, but who's working hard as a team to stay organized. And I saw that with the Korea game today, playing extremely, extremely, uh, you know, very clear who they were and how they want to play. Canada was like that. And of course, Saudi Arabia, very mm -hmm. organized defensively with six defenders at the back. So, Yes, everyone is developing their kind of brand. And the Canadian brand is looking really entertaining, to, to say the least. It does make me wonder, though, now, missed opportunity to get at least a point against Belgium. Now you have Croatia. Canada is not catching anyone off guard anymore. Do you think that makes things a little more difficult now going up against the Croatians? Yeah, I think perhaps the Canadian tempo is something to be experienced versus watched. Uh, I think when you think of the uh, age of some of the Croatian players that will be starting and um, what they bring to the table, I'm not sure it's the uh, pace and the tempo. And I think that's something that will continue to catch uh, or you know be to our advantage in the next game. Mm -hmm. I think facing a perhaps younger Moroccan side, especially with a stronger home fan or traveling fan base, um, perhaps would be challenging. So all the more reason to nail down the three points mm -hmm. against Croatia. So you set yourselves up in a really good position against Morocco. Are we in must win mode right now? I think it feels that way. Um, if we tie against Croatia, we're starting to cross our fingers against Morocco and how things start to go the other way. Um, and by all accounts, if Belgium wins and then Croatia wins, they kind of get together and say, maybe we just play for a draw and, and that does us in. So yeah, I think we're into that territory. So I, I, a little more about this, this kind of game day atmosphere. I've been hearing a lot about, um, I've heard it called Canada village, Canada house. What, what, what is this thing I've been hearing about it and have you been able to take part in it? Yeah. Uh, Canada soccer has put on something called Canada house and uh, quite a lot of the countries have, tried to make some sort of space their own for fans to pay in, to go experience, hang out, sing songs, the rest of it. Um, and these spaces are not cheap and, and Canada Soccer were able to secure a, a really brilliant location in the place called The Pearl, which is a very ritzy part of Doha, which is already a very ritzy city. And uh, we are up on a rooftop patio pool bar um, the night before the Canada game and they're running six events between then and uh, the last game against Morocco. And it was, you go in, you get some food, you get a gift, and you get seven beer tokens. Wow. So by all accounts, um, everyone was having a really good time, probably having their first drink of the trip uh, and just being able to connect with other Canada fans, taking some live music, watch highlights and game footage. Um, it's nice to feel a little bit more at home mm -hmm. uh, when you're so far away. Yeah, it's almost like you're building these little communities within a bigger community. Have you been able to partake in some of the local Qatar life or have they done a pretty, you know, I, I, it looks as though they're kind of trying to keep this event separate from maybe the everyday Qatar life. Have you been able to, to kind of uh, immerse yourself in the local scene a little bit? I'm not actually sure if you're a local that there is a traditional Qatar life at the minute. I was um, on the subway with a few other Canadians and we ran into some Qatari nationals and they said, well, school's actually out for our kids right now. Um, there's, there's no school going on. So we're in this place where, oh, did I lose you? No, you're, you you're good. Um, we're in, they're in this place where I think a lot of people have perhaps left the city. Uh, their regular schedule has been uh, shaken up and it's all because of the World Cup. Now, in saying that, I've been able to go down to uh, the souk, which is the uh, local market, more bizarre, 
Uh, you can go down and get your spices and your cheap soccer items and have a really, really good meal. Uh, so I've been doing that uh, very frequently as a lot of people have. But then you've also got the touristy options of some very, very cool architecture and mosques. You can drive to a beach across sand dunes um, and book camel rides. A lot of that stuff has been booked up and of course are going for much higher prices than they would normally. Um, but I've been able to take in quite a lot of good food and be around the marketplace and, and just where all the other fans are hanging out and trying to see what you know, the authentic Qatari lifestyle is. Um, what about temperature? I'm, I'm hearing dune and I'm thinking sand and I'm thinking hot desert. Is it as hot as I'm imagining? Or, or I mean, th this tournament was originally supposed to be played in the summer and heat wasn't a reason why it was moved to where, to this time of year. Is the, the, the weather more bearable this time of year in Qatar? I think um, the narrative and, and perhaps from my own thinking as well was like, oh man, this is going to be pretty spicy. And by all <laughs> accounts, it's actually been really pleasant. Uh, yeah. We're hanging around 30 in a particularly dry heat during the day and gets down to 20 or so in the evening. But you very much have this um, gap in what the... Uh, landscape is like and you know, one of the stadiums i'm going out to tomorrow and i went out to for the opening game was very much in the middle of a desert and you drive 45 minutes north of the city on a trafficless brand new highway and you arrive at the stadium and to your right away from the stadium is all this sand and by all accounts just desert uh, nothing there maybe a few random land compounds and then you've got this very lush oasis of a stadium where they've put down quite a lot of grass. It's very heavily watered. Um, they've got water features and parks and swings uh, all outside the stadium. So it's this very heavy contrast. And every now and again, you're reminded when you leave the stadium that, oh no, you're in, you're very much in a desert. And are, are these state-of-the-art stadiums that have been propped up? Yeah, very much so. There's one stadium that's a little bit older that used to be the Qatari national stadium and that's perhaps the most central Khalifa and that's where Canada will play Croatia in their next game but all these other stadiums are very new and I think I, I was probably one of the first to laugh at the idea of these air-conditioned uh, outdoor stadiums but I was very cold sitting in my seat at the wow. uh, Korea Ghana game you walk up to the stadium and it's 30 degrees and feeling good and you're in shorts and you get in there and there's these air conditionings just underneath your seats uh, below you, or in behind your legs and they keep everyone very fresh. Wow. Um, it's, it's for someone who spent a lot of time at Tim Hortons field, like you have to call this cold. I mean, it's, it, it has to be pretty chilly. To, I mean, maybe it's the, the body shock of not expecting that cold air uh, once you get to the stadium. You have to, I, I've seen it displayed everywhere. You have to fill us in on the Conca Cafe. What is this Conca Cafe I keep seeing? Yeah, it's this absolutely brilliant activation that the governing body has decided to put up. And they more or less um, partnered with a local uh, coffee shop in a very ritzy part of Doha. And they've converted it into this soccer-themed CONCACAF restaurant. And they've just tried to make it a home for all the CONCACAF fans and anyone else traveling to come out and have a free meal uh, almost every day at lunch. Uh, and then you also get to walk away with one of these uh, cool CONCACAF uh, packs. Uh, so it's uh, been a great place to visit almost every day. You go in, you get a free meal, and you hang out with the Mexican fans who have traveled, the Americans or the Salvadorians. And uh, it's just been a very, very cool place to um, be and hang out and experience something that feels a little bit more like home and something familiar with all of the CONCACAF diamonds and the turf they've laid down. And uh, it's a nice place to go take in a game and, and just mellow out. How is that body clock holding up? I, I know some of these matches you've been <laughs> to, you know, the Canada match, the first one you went to was what, 10 PM local time there for you. How, uh, how are you adjusting? My body clock is a gong show right now. <laughs> um, I arrived at 6 p.m. Qatar time uh, last Friday, which felt like, you know, mid-morning Canada time, but it gets dark very early here. So it felt actually like it was more like midnight when we looked out the window. So after a few days of hit and miss sleeps, I'm now back to a good eight hour schedule, except everything revolves around the games. So I've been to two 10 p.m. games. I'm going to sleep at three in the morning and I'm waking up at noon. And it's uh, bizarre, but that is simply what the schedule demands at the minute. And I will worry about my sleep schedule in a week and a half when I come back. 
Yeah, it's it's almost like, you know, Qatar's formed this entire civilization around soccer and your whole body now is just focused on soccer and not meals, not sleep, but soccer. And next time we talk to you, hopefully we'll be able to talk about a Canada W. James, thanks so much for doing this again. No, my pleasure. I'll talk to you soon. Yes.